Hi guys, it's Adam and welcome to another video. So in today's video, we are going to be taking a look at this book here, An Introduction to Nietzsche by Lucy Huskinson. And Lucy is actually a lecturer here at Bangor University. Uh, she's in the philosophy department, hence, of course, it's a book on Nietzsche. Um, and this is a really good introduction. Now, of course, I bought it knowing that uh, she was a lecturer here, and I think I found out about the book that way. Um, and it is a really nice, uh, concise introduction. It's only 93 pages, I believe. I think I looked the other day. Uh, yeah, 93 pages. Um, but for what it is, it's incredibly detailed. I think there's a better word to use, but certainly incredibly detailed, uh, packed full of information, packed full of ideas and uh, and, and different explanations of, as well of these concepts. So uh, just for a kind of brief uh, look through the book, obviously, because I'm do doing this book review. Um, first off, it starts with kind of a short biography of Nietzsche's life. So uh, where he was born, when he was born, that sort of stuff. In fact, before that biography, there is a handy little date chart. So it gives you his life in sort of years and it'll tell you what happened, like significant events in his life at certain different points. That was really, really nice for me. And it's something that I'm going to look back on as well uh, when I'm thinking about Nietzsche, when I'm philosophizing about things around his work and stuff and particularly when I'm wanting to know something about his life as well uh, it was really really nice little date chart but yeah in the biography uh, it talks about of course um, his collapse in Turin as well and things like that uh, I believe it was in 1889 I have heard some people say it was 1888 but I think the date was January 1889 um, I don't know whether it says the specific date in here, it might do. Uh, it has been about, I don't know, three or four weeks since I've actually read this book, so I am doing this review a little bit later. Um, but yeah, it certainly talks about that anyway, um, and it'll definitely give the year, if not the, the month. Um, so yeah, it talks about that. It talks about, of course, the general flow of his life. It talks about uh, Basel as well and theology and all that sort of stuff that he was into early on. Uh, the professorship at, at Basel when he was 24 and all that sort of stuff, usual sort of stuff that you would know if you knew Nietzsche. Uh, and that's why it's a great introduction because it's probably not the case that you're going to know that. Or if you do, then it's a nice, obviously, it's a nice refresher on certain aspects of his life. Uh, and it goes into, um, you know, different works that he did at different points of his life and stuff like that. And then in the book, we get on to uh, a bit of uh, more of his concepts and things like that. So if I remember rightly, more to the front of the book is things like slave morality and master morality. Uh, then a little bit further is like the Ubermensch and uh, actually uh, a little bit before that is the will to power and the will to truth, which was absolutely brilliant for me. Um, now, I've had a lot of in what you would call indirect exposure to Nietzsche's ideas and Nietzsche's work through various books on him as a figure, so um, introductions or um, Lillian's book on the, the psychological approach to his life and work and stuff like that, um, and also I've read online quite a lot, uh, Wikipedia on Cuora, um, loads of different snippets from biographies and quotes and bits from Zarathustra and all sorts of you know, loads of different bits and bobs, but I've never, I've only read directly two of his works. So I've had quite a uh, intuitive look at Nietzsche, you would say, an indirect intuitive look. Um, uh, and so um, obviously at some point down the line, I'm going to be reading a few of his books, uh, particularly obviously Zarathustra, naturally, uh, Will to Power, I want to read, um, and, uh, you know, maybe a couple of others as well. But what I like to do is I like to, uh, and I've debated this actually because I don't think this is particularly the best way of doing things. But what I like to do or what I tend to do is read a book on one thing and then read a book on something completely different. Now, if you have any sense of, let's say, uh, the depth and the accumulation of knowledge in a, um, you know, a very piercing way, you would say, well, actually, 
do it by author, so read like all of the works of one author, but I can't do that with the way, way my brain is for some weird reason. I find I can do it for maybe two or three books, but I can't do it for, let's say, ten books. I, I, I need variety. It's just the way in which my brain is wired. It needs a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of the other, a bit of it. So that's what I do. And it served me okay, but I would like to explore that, um, you know, that idea that I don't get on with so well in the future. Um, but yeah, so uh, this was really nice for me. It gave me a few different ideas and a few different kind of um, modes of thought, let's say, when, when thinking about Nietzsche and his philosophy. Some of it, of course, I was I was familiar with already, hence, you know, from, of course, the, the research I just discussed. But the uh, particular concepts in here that gave me a bit more depth were things like the slave morality, master morality, the will to truth really illuminated certain things within me and, and also gave me a bit of a, a kind of, I kind of self-analyzed my own work and my own essays and things like that that I've wrote. And it gave me a bit of a newfound perspective on those. So that was really nice. Um, and then going a little bit further in the book, I think we have The Death of God. So that was a fair few pages actually in here. And that was really, really good. The other brilliant thing about this book, I know I'm, I'm being very one-sided saying it's it's positive. I, I would say maybe uh, as, as one negative, and this is really just because it's 93 pages, is, you know, it, it, there could be more meat on the bone. There could be uh, deeper explanations, of course. But then again, that can always be the case. And that's not what this book is about. This book is about a short, brief introduction. And for what that is, it does well. Obviously, if it was wanting to be a bit longer, or if it was a bit longer, and it didn't really give me that much information, um, then that would certainly be a, a downside of the book. Or, of course, um, uh, generally, if it if it wanted to be a bit longer and it wasn't, and there wasn't much in there, then of course that would be a negative. But as it stands, um, yeah, you know, there isn't much I can say that that is wrong with this book. It's really nicely written. Uh, so another thing is that it's not too scholarly. Sometimes, and I'm prone to this because I, I kind of love language as well, so it's very, very hard for me because I like to put in big words, almost in a way bombastic words or uh, something a, a little bit too... Um, I don't know if superfluous would be a good word to use. And I'm even doing it now, you see. I'm using words like... Um, superfluous and whatever the other one I just used I've got to forget but um yeah so I, I do that sometimes and I like I do like that because I love language and I love these beautiful words uh, you know like splendiferous and stuff like that like just juicy and bubbly instead of saying splendid you can say splendiferous or instead of saying big you can say gargantuan isn't it doesn't that powerful sound just isn't it beautiful? Isn't it like the French? You know, I always think of the French when I think about language because the French have the masculine and feminine uh, words and things like that. And, and it's a union of opposites. It's a kind of making love in conversation. And that's why, I, that's why I like the French language. I really do I like the French language. And at one point, I do want to learn it. I know a little, like little tidbits of French, but... I really want to learn French at some point. And that, so that's why I like putting big words in, because it's kind of like this love affair and seeing the combinations of different words you can use to make sentences poetic and rhythmic and flowing and, and it's beautiful. But in this book, it doesn't do that too much. I mean, there is definitely uh, some hints, let's say small hints of poetic writing in there. And certainly there are some slightly more powerful words but it doesn't do it to, to alienate the reader. It doesn't do it to to be uh, to the extent of, oh, I've got to go and get a dictionary, you know. There might be only a couple of words in here. You might think, oh, you know, I'm not sure on that word. I'll have to look it up. So that's a, uh, that is to the merit of this book because a lot of scholars don't do that. A lot of scholars do. Um, and mainly it's when they're writing for the scholars as well because they know that those people are going to understand the, the language and stuff. But yeah, so that was brilliant. Um, so I really like that about this book. And it just made it a bit easier to, to get through as well. 
Now, the other thing I was going to mention before I kind of interrupted myself and then went off on a tangent is that uh, this book has direct quotations from Nietzsche's working. Now, that is beautiful. That's exactly what I want to see. I love books. Uh, when we're talking about a figure from history, whoever it is, a philosopher or whatever, obviously less so if it's like a, a fantasy figure or something because there's not really direct quotations. But if it's a you know a philosopher, a psychologist or something like that, I like to see direct quotations because then you can reference their exact words and you can think, right, okay, I, I, that's what this person said. I understand that now. And then I do like, uh, some people like this, some people don't like this because commentary is a bit like that really. It can obscure things and it can, or it can elevate things. Uh, sometimes it does both and sometimes, it, you know, in different uh, paragraphs and stuff uh, in certain books, not necessarily in this book, but in certain books, um, it, you know, it can obscure, it can elevate and stuff. So, so you do have to look at commentary with a little bit of a, uh, you know, a piercing view, your, your own eye and think and your own judgment. Um, but yeah, I like the commentary as well, especially if it's a good commentary. Now, I do not, I do have a nitpick with commentary. Uh, I despise anyone, <laughs> this is a bit of my own shadow, I despise anyone who for their entire life, um, comments is, is just a commentator on someone else's life so imagine for example with myself it's a great example um if i were to write all of my books commenting on nietzsche's work or on jung's work or on someone else's work but never really contribute anything of my own then i'd be a commentator and i i don't think those people really fully grasp what life is about or their own journey on life and I've only got to that of course from my own folly and my own uh, being a commentator for, for example and you do get to that understanding from that now it's fine of course if you want to write an introduction or a book on someone on a figure but leave it to that just write the one book and then get on with your own work you know so when I say get on with your own work what do I mean well I mean writing a book that necessarily doesn't rely heavily on the ideas from people in the past but simply uses the ideas from the past and from people in the past along with your own philosophizing your own um, thinking about psychology or wh whatever domain you're in or poetry or whatever it may be and and synthesizing a new type of thought or um, a, you know a new philosophy a new a new uh, let's say um, I don't know, just just a new thing out of the old things. But if you're just going to comment on the old things, I can't get behind you as a person in the sense of not as an individual in a in a feeling type way, but just a, as a as an individual who is a philosopher or who is a psychologist in their own right. You see, that's what I saw. So if you're just a commenter, I can't I can't really get behind you. You need to bring something of yourself and and uh, it's kind of like you get into this uh, bog uh, or, or this kind of just this um, unproductive or uncreative environment when you're just commenting on people's work you're just there commenting 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 there's, there's less individual thought there because it really does take a very very creative person to say okay these people have done it this way in the past Okay, I take that on board, I get that. Now let's see if I can recombine that, add bits of my own thought, do different things, and then synthesize my own philosophy and my own ideology, let's say. Um, ideology might be a bit too much of a strong word, but my own, let's say, generally just philosophy. And um, and uh, so so if you're going to go down that route, then then I can applaud you because then I can say, well, you know, I'm glad you've done that because that's I know that's a bloody hard task because I've tried with that and I've had some success with it, but it's taken me many years to try and uh, since I was basically like 22, which now which will be four years, almost five years now, to even get somewhere with it, um, to get you know to find a little bit of my own voice even so. I commend people who do that. Um, so yeah, um, the direct quotations are brilliant because it gives you direct access to their work. You're not having to take 
any paraphrasing or things like that. Now, I am a bit of a hypocrite again because in my own work, particularly in the last essay book I did, um, I don't put many direct quotations in there from people. I do put a few in there from Nietzsche, from Jung, from um, uh, D.T. Suzuki, actually, from, I think, I believe, believe maybe Alan Watts as well, and, you know, a few other people, maybe Cam uh, not Campbell, Peterson, uh, you know, a few others, but I don't put, considering it's, you know, 200-odd page essay book, I don't put that many quotations in. And uh, um, so, I, you know, I am a bit hypocritical in that way. And the reason I don't put many quotations in is for the reason I've just explained, which is uh, for that kind of new thought to come through. I don't really want to be relying upon the quotations from other people. I'll use them as a way to kind of back up my arguments a little bit, but I want really to synthesize that original thought, to synthesize these real deep ideas that I've gone into uh, great complexity with, within my own thought and within my own rumination, and then I'm placing them on the, on the page without the need for loads and loads of quotation from different people but in these sorts of books particularly uh, these are more like commentary books and so it's definitely a need it's less so a need in essay books but it's definitely a need in these sort of books to have direct quotations at least in my opinion i know other people might say well you know you could get away with not doing so many direct quotations and that's fair enough but for me i, I yeah i really like it and i really think it is valuable if people put direct quotations in these introductions and things like that so anyway i will leave it there guys we're on 17 minutes so it's not been too long that is the book there i will leave a link down below to the amazon page uh, for this book um, Introduction to Nietzsche by Lucy Huskinson. Uh, and yeah, really nice. I did really enjoy it. So it has been a very, very positive review. Um, I tried to slip in one negative, but didn't really have too much success with that. But what can I say? It was a nice book. So there we go. So thank you very much for watching, guys. And I will see you in the next one. See you soon, guys. Mm -hmm.